What's up class and welcome to my first tips and tricks video for my new Space Camp series. In this video we're going to be taking an in-depth look into the lock picking system in Starfield and ultimately crack the code. Before we jump into it, one of the reasons these early Space Camp tutorials will be so helpful to people is because Bethesda is notorious for not explaining how to do many things in their games. You know, sometimes they're complex things, sometimes they're quite simple. If you're a veteran Fallout 4 player, you're going to be surprised to learned that I made an early video on how to throw grenades. That video has over 176,000 views. I know, right? That many people didn't know how to throw a freaking grenade. Probably more, actually, that never found my video. But it goes to show that these simple tutorials can make a big difference in player enjoyment of the game, and we shouldn't take that for granted. Now, the lockpicking video is definitely justified, but I'm also going to put out some videos that are going to seem pretty simple, too, but are going to help a lot of people that just... I mean, it could be something as simple as just not knowing what button to push. You know, if they're going to look it up online, might as well come to the school zone, you know what I'm saying? Now, the first time you encounter a safe in the game, and this system also works the same way for hacking computers, you'll notice one of two things are going to happen when you try to engage it. Either you don't have any digit picks, or you get thrust into something that looks sort of labyrinthian, you know what I mean? Digipix are the equivalent in Starfield to bobby pins in Fallout 4. So you need to collect those by scavenging around in the game, you know, looting bodies or buying them from vendors. Once you have some Digipix, you'll be able to pick any novice locks without spending any skill points. All that so far is pretty similar to past Bethesda games. But then things diverge pretty quickly with their mini game. I'm not entirely sure what the digipics are supposed to represent because the animation seems to pull up something that looks like a single lens binoculars called a monocular. It would have made sense if they had you then rerouting circuits or something, but instead you need to rotate these cylinders as if they were actual lock tumblers. That's why in my last video I called the locks in the game kind of a cross between mechanical and electronic locks. I don't know, maybe they're supposed to be mag locks or something. Anyway, once it brings up the mini game, the fun and the headaches begin. You'll get overconfident with the novice locks because they're easy to solve. All the keys are used so you won't think about it too much. But as soon as you hit advanced locks, your understanding of the way it works will fly out the window. But fret not because I'm here to make sense of it all for you. First, let's define the terms, okay? Digipix are the tools themselves used to hack the locks, and you can see how many you have here remaining on the right. As expected, if you mess up or back out of the game, then it'll cost you another Digipick to try again. Digipicks can also be used to undo a bad move. We'll get into that later. On the left, we have the lock rings. These are the consecutive circles with gaps in them that need to be completed before they disappear. Now, each ring needs to be fully filled in before you can advance the next level down. Then we have the keys. These are the options it gives you in the black box to the right. It'll take multiple keys to solve the puzzle, and not every key will be used after the novice level locks. That's what threw me off for a while when I first encountered the more advanced locks. Anyway, you can scroll through the different key combinations by using the left and right bumpers on your controller. Something I also didn't figure out for a while as the game doesn't explain that to you. Next, we have the ring slots. These are the gaps in the circles where the keys will fit. And when they use the term slot keys down here, they're using the word slot as a verb. That can be equally confusing because at first I was like, what are slot keys? <laughs> you know, are they different from Digipix? Oh no, you mean press the button when you're ready to slot the key, i.e. to confirm it. Then it made sense. Now once you commit to it, you have to go with it or else use another Digipick to undo it and back up. Okay, next we have the auto slot feature. When you put more skill points into lock picking, which they call security in Starfield, then you'll be able to bank, i.e. accumulate these auto slot attempts. Using one of your auto slot attempts will show you a correct key to use for the slot ring. However, it's not always the best option. Usually it is, but not always. It only shows you one that works. That doesn't mean you should necessarily use it. I'll explain more about that in a moment. Anyway, in order to complete all the gaps in each ring and make it disappear, you'll have to use multiple keys. However, each key can only be used once. So if you use a key that works, but is not necessarily the ideal key to use, then you won't be able to use it later on an inner ring where it might be better served. That's where the challenge comes into play. You know, deciding which key is the best to use in advance. So with the way Bethesda designed this minigame, you're really going to have to take your time and look ahead 
at what you might need for a lower ring before committing to using a key on an upper ring. Now ultimately, that's going to make lockpicking in Starfield more time consuming than in previous games. You know, they did a lot of things to save you time in Starfield, like you can fast travel right out of buildings, which is awesome. <laughs> But uh, they definitely made lock picking in Starfield more time consuming. So I recommend two things before we solve a couple of locks together. One, always buy digipix from vendors whenever you're selling stuff and they happen to be available at that vendor. And I believe you can find them in the miscellaneous menu. That's actually good that they put them in the miscellaneous menu because the resources menu is like your junk in Fallout 4 and... Uh, when you go to your starship and you want to put everything in the hold, you can just hit uh, store all resources. And if they had put the digipix in there um, or even in the aid section, then you might be dumping your digipix and forget about it and might not have it the next time you run into a lock. So it's good they put them in the miscellaneous section. Number two, always quick save before you tackle any lock or computer. You may end up using all of your digipix if you don't and have nothing left for a door that you may need to open later to access a deeper level of the lair. I'm not a huge advocate for save scumming, but <laughs> it's going to help with this uh, particular minigame. Now, as far as solving the puzzle, the light bulb didn't click until I advanced to the next level of the security skill where it'll start highlighting the rings in blue if they will work. I didn't even realize that's what the color change meant until after some trial and error. That was a hugely helpful indicator because it gives you exactly the feedback that you need to make sense of it. And it doesn't just highlight the ring that you're working on in blue, it also shows you if that key will work on lower rings as well, which is incredibly helpful. Sometimes you might even see the outer ring in blue, the next ring down in gray, and then the inner ring in blue again. That means the key you selected will work on the outer and inner rings, but not the middle ring. So here are some tips and tricks that I use now to solve the mini game every single time. In fact, I've gotten so good at it now that I don't even bother using the auto slot feature anymore. I can solve them with 100% certainty, okay? The first tip is to try and use the keys on the right with the most notches first. The reason being is that the less notches, the more versatile the keys will be to use on the lower rings. For example, the single notch keys can be used anywhere at any time, but they're few and far between. So I always try and save those for last if I can as sort of an emergency option, you know what I mean? Number two, if you find a key that works on the current ring, then take a moment before you commit to it and see if it'll work on any of the lower rings as well. If it can, then you might want to double check and see if there's any better options before you commit to it. This is where my comment about the auto slot feature comes into play. Sometimes that feature will suggest an option for you that absolutely works, but could be better served on a lower ring. So you kind of have to look ahead and solve the puzzle in your head a little bit first. Number three, remember that as the locks become more difficult, the mini game will throw several key options on the right that won't work on any of the rings. I call those the decoys. <laughs> They're pretty much added in the game just to throw you off your game. Number four, with a little practice, you'll be able to notice subtle differences in the central angles of the notches. Now central angles is a geometry term for the angles formed by different distances of the place notches around the circumference of a circle. And sometimes the game really tries to spoof you, especially with master locks, by having one key option that has two notches at like a 120 degree angle and another one at a 140 degree angle. So they both look like they may work until you actually get tinkering with them. So my next tip is going to be the ringer. Number five, for those challenging keys, I try to imagine a clock face where those notches will be positioned if I moved one of them up to the 12 o'clock position. So here's an easy way to visualize it. One o'clock is a 30 degree angle, two o'clock is a 60 degree angle, three o'clock is a 90 degree angle, four is 120 degrees, five is 150 degrees, and six is 180 degrees. And then it just wraps around and starts over. So that little trick helps me every time. I see two that look very similar to each other, like say they have just two notches, and I'll go, okay, that one looks like a four o'clock, but then that one looks like a five o'clock. Ah, so one might be a spoof, you know, just try to get you to use one up and then later you won't be able to use the other one, you know, and you'll have to back out or start all over again. So having said all that, hopefully I didn't complicate it for you and uh, I made it a whole lot easier with some of those tricks. So let's solve some of these together so you could see me walk the walk and not just talk the talk.
Okay, so we'll start off with a novice lock here just so I can kind of show you the basics. Let's jump into this. Okay, so with the novice locks, all four of those keys to the right are going to be used. It's just a matter of which ones you use on the outer circle and which you use on the inner circle. And sometimes even the novice locks can actually trip you up a little bit. So uh, I am going to... I'm gonna tab over, that one doesn't work. I can tell just from the jump because I've advanced my security level enough to know when the rings are colored blue, if that key will work. So I can tell this outer ring is white. That means this key won't work. That key won't work. That means this key must work. Okay, so that is the only possibility. Let's go ahead and do that. And then we're back to this one. Okay, moving right along to the advanced locks. Let's give this one a shot. Okay, so... Like I mentioned earlier, I try to use the lock options on the right with the most key slots first. So, it's looking like four is the maximum here. I'm going to head down to this one. And then look and see if there is a three slaughter that would fit and it doesn't look like there would be. So let's try. Nope. Okay. So it looks like this one is going to be the one to use. Okay. And that is going to be the right place for it. And then I can see that the next lock over to it to the right is going to fit once I put this one in place because it looks like it's at approximately a two o'clock position and maybe like a seven o'clock position or something. So let's see if I'm right. Yep, I am right. Bingo. Okay. All right. So let's go back to this one and I can see that the next one over is going to fit with three notches in a row there. So I'm going to go ahead and commit to this one and roll this right over into place. Perfect. Okay. And as you can see, this one has more credits, but that's all that's in here. So it's a bump up. I'll take it. Thousand credits is nothing to shake a stick at. Okay, and now we're gonna skip right over to a master lock. If you recognize this, it is a display case at the lodge that holds some interesting armor. If you don't wanna be spoiled <laughs> about what the armor is, it's not that big of a deal, let me tell you. But if you don't wanna be spoiled, then click away. Otherwise, I will show you what it has to offer after we conquer this master lock. All right, let's go. Okay, let's see what we're working with here. Okay, so that one has four, but it's unusable on this level. That one is usable on this level, and it looks like it would fit right there. But I don't have just a twofer left. So let's keep looking. Okay, so that one's an option, and... It does look like this next one over would fit right there. I'm glad they let you keep the placeholders when you tab, you know, left to right. So I think that combination will solve this one. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and commit to it and commit to it, boom. Okay, so this one has four, but it's unusable because it's not highlighted in blue. So let's keep moving on to this one. And let's see what we're working with here. Okay, so it's probably gonna be usable in this position. And then I can see a possibility of this one being used right here. So let's see if I'm right. and you sort of have to memorize the empty slot position. So what I'm looking at here is a 12 o'clock, a six o'clock, and like an eight o'clock that will be remaining. And this one right here looks like it would fit that eight o'clock. Yes, it does look like I appear to be right. 
So let's go ahead and commit to that one and this one. Perfect. Okay. See how that clock face tip really helps? All right, moving on to this option. Ooh, and we do have an option here, uh, but that would leave one key slot left and there is only one universal. Oh no, there is two universal keys. Okay. So that means if we have to use one on the final inner ring, then we should be okay. Let's just solve the inner ring first and make sure we're not going to need both. Okay, so for that inner ring, we're looking at maybe this option here. Nope. This option, nope. Nope. There we go. That one would work and that would leave us with three. And, ooh, see how this one wouldn't work on the inner one. So we might still need those two universal keys for the inside one. So let's see here. Okay, so that one would work. And this one might work, actually, if we position it right there. Okay, so I think we solved our inner ring. So now I can go ahead and move on to this one, commit to it, and then back up to the universal key, solve it. And then it was this one. And then, oh, I messed up. <laughs> so I have to back up. <laughs> okay. Let's see here. No, I didn't mess up. Okay, so we're just going to use this one right here and then that one right there. Boom, okay. I doubted my confidence there. Okay, so let's take a look at what's in the mannequin here. Okay, so we have these uh, suit series called the Mark I. It's got a basic pack. It's got, it looks kind of cool though. It's got some good stats, but it has no epic, legendary, or rare abilities. The helmet is kind of average. Um, it's got a pretty high resale value, actually. What I would do is I would probably take this and put it on a mannequin in my favorite settlement. Um, but I like the Mantis armor that I'm wearing, and uh, I will cover that in a future video. So, I hope you guys uh, found this video helpful. Even that Master Lock almost tripped me up. I had it right, but then I started to doubt myself. But you really do have to solve it ahead of time to make sure you're not using the keys on the current ring that might be more useful on a lower ring. But hopefully this video made sense of it all for you. And we're going to continue on with the tips and tricks with Starfield. And for those that are still craving Fallout 4, I will continue to be intersprinkling Fallout 4 videos and no mod shot classes. So fret not. It's going to be a balancing act. I do want to try to get out a few more Starfield videos while the irons are hot. And then I'll keep bouncing back and forth between the two because the... Uh, the starship building system and the outpost building system in Starfield is pretty cool, but it doesn't have quite the customization and flexibility that you have in Fallout 4, especially when you're using the uh, the glitches, so to speak. So thank you guys for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and I'll see you in the next video. Stay smart.